Kate Rader, with the League of Women Voters. Usually at this time, I give a pitch for the League and say, please join us. But consider that done because it really isn't time tonight. I will say that for those of you who are interested in issues that this series is covering, there's a sheet in the back of the room with some resources for you to do the reading and finding out about these things. And now I will turn it over to Savannah Davis who will tell us a little, she's Executive Director of Racial Equity, and she will tell us a little bit about her job and then introduce our competitor to our next. So I am a seasoned Vermonter, <laughs> um, and, and have learned quite a bit uh, in these last six months. I will briefly uh, talk about this role a little bit, but I know that I'm not who you really came to see, so I'll make my comments brief. Um, this is a role that was created by an act of the legislature in 2018, signed into law by the governor in June of 2018. And it creates this role and an advisory panel of five appointees that acts in an advisory capacity to the person in this role. The tasks are numerous. The staffing, you are looking at it. <laughs> um, some of the things that I'm required to complete are top to bottom organizational review of all three branches of state government to identify systemic racism. Step two, <laughs> um, overseeing the statewide collection of race data, developing performance targets and metrics, um, for developing and conducting trainings for state agencies, developing model diversity policies and best practices, serving as liaison to the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council, the Governor's Cabinet and the Human Rights Commission, um, and I've been made aware that there are at least three bills this session to expand those duties. Um, and it's a part-time job. <laughs> oh, and there's a five-year sunset on it as well. So, we have a lot of work to do. Which means, because one person cannot do all of that, it requires that all of you also participate. And in order for you to do that, you have people like Board who are here to help you understand the nature of the issues and how to tackle them. So I'm so happy to see that we have a full room here tonight because one of the most important things in my work is getting people in this state comfortable having conversations about equity. If we don't talk about it, we are guaranteeing ourselves not to do anything about it. But having the conversation can be hard, especially in a state like ours that's so homogenous. How do we have a conversation about equity as members of dominant groups without accidentally or intentionally centering ourselves in those conversations? It requires that we learn when to step forward and when to step back. When to take our guidance and our leadership from other people. And as you all know, there are two different kinds of leadership. There's leadership from people with lived experience leadership from impacted groups, and then there's leadership in title and in positions of authority that are designated and carved out. Lucky for this crowd, Borian has both. She completed her BA uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and then her Juris Doctor from the University at Michigan, I'm sorry, Minnesota, and I apologize, I have a cheat sheet because she has a long, illustrious career, and I couldn't remember it all, uh, from the University of Minnesota Law School. Before she came to Vermont, she was actually a, a college instructor for a legal studies program. Um, there, she practiced law, family law, government, and social security administration, and representing indigent clients uh, and victims of domestic violence. She came to Vermont and in 2015 joined the Human Rights Commission as a staff attorney investigating claims of discrimination in housing, government, work, service, uh, and places of public accommodation. That's a lot of experience. It's a lot of experience as a person with lived experience, working with communities, working with young people, working with impacted populations. 
and then working with government talking to address these issues. Today, we are fortunate to have her as our state's executive director for the Human Rights Commission and as legal counsel to the Human Rights Commission. In that role, she supervises investigations, she litigates on behalf of the public good, she advances policies on civil rights. I have run into her a number of times already testifying at the State House just this session alone. And she conducts trainings like these on implicit bias, on fair housing, bullying, harassment, hazing. So I'm extremely excited to see her speak for the first time actually since my being here. I hope you all are too and I ask you to join me in welcoming our Human Rights Commission Executive Director, Oye. That was so nice. What an honor to be introduced by Susanna. <coughs> Thank you so much. I always thought the work of the Human Rights Commission was way too big and not enough for the five and out six of us. But then I think about the work that you have to do for one of you and I go, ooh, at least somebody in state government is doing a lot more or has a harder, larger mandate than us. Thank you for being here tonight. It is cold and it is late and I am so appreciative that this is a room that is full of people who are um, engaged and interested in this topic. So thank you so much. Um, can I ask for the light? light? Yeah. Also, I want to say that we do have um, recording tonight and press is also here. Um, and so I want to just share that in case anything that we talk about today sort of uh, triggers a memory or, or want, uh, encourages you to share a personal story is that sometimes people may not feel comfortable knowing that press is here. Um, and also that I would ask press to sort of just be mindful that sometimes the stories that are shared here are personal and um, intended for this audience, but not necessarily intended for the larger audience. So just to be mindful of that. Um, all right, so implicit bias, oh boy. Okay, anytime we talk about bias, wow. Okay, I would say that throughout this conversation tonight, and I really do call it a conversation, there's going to come a point where it might be a little bit uncomfortable. And I think that we need to start getting into a position of being comfortable with being uncomfortable if we're actually going to make change or see change happen. And so just kind of be mindful with that. Of that, if you at any point feel uncomfortable, one, I'm completely open to being challenged. I've done this training a lot to lots of different kinds of people, many of whom have challenged me, and that is great and perfect, and that actually helps the discussion. But also, um, sort of just sit with that for a second if you're uncomfortable, and ask yourself, why does this make me uncomfortable? And then if you're not like okay with wanting to challenge, we can certainly talk about it afterwards. So feel free to email me a challenging question or to raise a concern. And also this is a, uh, a training that is constantly changing and so I would appreciate any advice or opinions that you might have about it too. All right? Okay, so let's get started. So I'm going to start with a story because I am a, 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 I like stories, I learn from hearing stories. So. I moved here from Minneapolis about five years ago, and uh, Minneapolis has been sort of this mecca or this city that has been very immigrant friendly. And in the neighborhood that I lived in, we had a lot of Somali uh, new Americans. Um, I think Minnesota is home to 52,000 plus um, Somali Americans. And yes, and um, it so happened that my neighborhood was very diverse and had a lot of Somali Americans. And I drive down this street called Lake Street, and uh, it's about 35 miles per hour, but I'm going 40 miles per hour down this, which is acceptable, okay? <laughs> so I'm going 40 miles per hour. The rule is if you go five, you're good, okay? Some people say 10, but not me. So I'm, okay, so I'm going 40 miles per hour on occasion, I would see a Somali man or woman step out into the middle of traffic and put their hands up, okay? And at first, it like really shocked me because I, 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 I was like, uh, oh boy, this is very dangerous, don't do that. And then after a few times, I'd go, what the heck, lady? That's not okay, right? So you get to, uh, I'm getting angry. I'm a pretty compassionate person, but there was a part of me that was like, this is just plain dangerous. You can't just put your hand out in traffic and expect people to stop. 
So like a few years after that, I'm at a CLE, and CLE for non-lawyers is a continuing legal education. Um, and I'm on the panel, and the purpose of this panel is to talk about how to serve immigrant populations. I'm there to talk about how to serve the Hmong. And next to me was a Somali-American attorney who was there to talk about how to serve uh, the Somali population. And I really was just listening to him the whole time. And he was talking about how um, uh, Somali refugees have really lived for like the last 28 years in a civil war and anarchy and how there really was no rule or law or order and how in America we live completely under rule, law and order, like red lights, stop signs, things like that. And I would say that that, real, that moment, hearing that, really opened my eyes to like just trying to be more compassionate and understanding. And I saw a visual of the men and women who were like, stop. Okay. Fast forward 10 years. I'm traveling to Hanoi, Vietnam. I'm here. Okay. So I want you to look at this picture. Uh, there is no order here whatsoever. If you take a look, the traffic is going in all sorts of directions, and they are going very fast. And this is all of Hanoi too, but this happens to be a very busy intersection, if you can even call it that. And our tour guide says, we're gonna cross this, <laughs> okay? And I, we are like, whoa, that doesn't feel very safe, are you sure? So we are all holding on to each other's shirts <laughs> while she's leading us. She steps out into traffic, and I kid you not, she put out her hand, <laughs> okay? She put out her hand, and traffic stopped, okay? I thought that I got it until that very moment when I realized, oh, okay. So that's a really long-winded story to tell you that this is really the beginning of what I hope is many, many conversations about implicit bias and that this is an it. You're not going to come here and have a two-hour training on implicit bias, and that's going to be good enough. It really isn't. We need to seek out those experiences. We need to make real change by looking at our policies and our hiring practices. Those are things that really do make a difference. This is how we start that conversation. And so I just want you to remember this story for that purpose. Yes? OK. Thank you. So what are our goals tonight? Increase our understanding of the nature and sources of implicit bias. Recognize our own biases. Understand how bias affects perceptions and behavior. Develop skill strategies for reducing or overriding our biases. In two hours. Yes. Yes. So to understand bias, we have to start with human behavior. And we have to understand that we have about 100 years of studies on cognition and the unconscious mind and 30 plus years of study on implicit bias that tells us that a huge, huge chunk of how our brain works is outside of our conscious awareness, right? It is below the surface. We're not necessarily even aware of it when it's happening. When you think about um, unconscious, when I'm talking about, I'm not talking about being asleep or not awake. I'm talking about not really putting a lot of mental effort into something. For example, I work in Montpelier, but I live in Pittsfield. Anybody know where Pittsfield is? Okay, yeah. it's 45 minutes from here on a good day, an hour in the winter. Okay, so it's far, and there are times during my drive on 89 <coughs> South where I look up and I go. Did I pass Randolph yet or didn't I? <laughs> yeah, because I want to know how, long, how much longer is the drive, right? And I haven't paid attention necessarily to. And sometimes that's actually a beautiful realization because I go, wow, it's really pretty because it looks different than it does at, at other times. Also on the weekends, if I'm in the wrong lane and I'm, I want to go 89 south, but I'm going 89 north like I'm going to work, I'm going to regret that. Right? Yeah. That's a really long, uh, regretful drive to turn back around. Right. So a lot of what we do is outside of our conscious awareness. The things that are within our conscious awareness are usually things that are out of the ordinary. For example, planning a budget or planning a vacation, things that you don't typically do. It requires some mental effort to engage in those things. 
But keep in mind that just because it is conscious doesn't mean that it is rational. Uh -huh. Okay, like my husband t tells me, I plan way too many vacations that we should not be going on. Right, so this is not very rational, and uh, and many times when we think of uh, the the conscious mind, um, we think of things that uh, are happening in the neocortex. So the brain is divided into three relative parts: the neocortex, the limbic system, and the reptilian brain. And the neocortex here is represented in the purple or slash blue. This is. Uh, responsible for our conscious thought, our language, our reasoning. The limbic system categorizes what we perceive and our emotions. And then the reptilian brain controls the body's vital functions, our instincts, our fight flight, our gut reaction. When someone walks into the room, you go, is he dangerous or not? Or you go, oh, she seems nice, maybe not. It's sort of this initial reaction that you might have to someone or something that is you, different. And that's happening very fast, and there's no time to really process that. Whereas the neocortex is really that part of the brain that is above the surface that we're spending a lot of time um, utilizing when we have to do something out of the ordinary. Okay. When we think of explicit bias, we think of this, right? There's this a 1927 KKK rally in Montpelier. Explicit bias here is reflective. It requires motivation, it takes effort, it takes a lot of time to get together and engage in this level of hate. And this is usually what most people think of when they think of explicit bias. I have a question for you. Who do you think they were protesting against in 1927 in Montpelier? Any guess? Catholics. Catholics, yes, Catholics. Yes, Catholics. Although some would say that Catholics is also connected to the immigrant population at yeah. the time, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. But explicit bias can also look like this. Okay. Um, this picture over here of the two boys is actually from an advertisement that came under fire for putting the African-American kid in a sweatshirt that says, coolest monkey wow. in the jungle. But um, I wanted to show you this because oftentimes, when we think of explicit bias, we're thinking of the KKK or people who engage in this kind of hate. But explicit bias can also come in the form of someone who is beloved, someone who probably deserves compassion, someone who we um, know have known for a very long time. And I mention it because it's important that explicit bias can be extremely harmful, even if it shows up in this form. So when you have a little kid that comes to school and they use a derogatory term for a certain racial group, for teachers or staff or the principal to say, he's just a little kid, he doesn't know what he's doing, or he doesn't know what he's talking about, or he learned it from home, those kinds of excuses actually can create greater harm to the victims who hear those. And so not excusing it by uh, trying to justify who it comes out of is important. Or um, this gentleman over here where we're saying he grew up in a different time. Right? Not saying that. I, it, I mean, I think it's okay to call it out for what it is. Um, if they make a racist comment, it's a racist comment, and let's not excuse that. If they make a sexist comment, it's a sexist comment, and let's not excuse that. That doesn't mean they don't deserve some compassion, because they, there's opportunities here for, for learning as well. But let's sort of recognize that. Okay. Most of today, we're talking about implicit bias, not explicit bias, which is the part of our brain that is uh, uh, working most of the time. It's efficient, it's based on exposure, things that we have connected over time in terms of our memory outside of our awareness, and like I said, happening very, very fast. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Types of bias, anchoring bias, confirmation bias, and affinity bias. So anchoring bias is some of those initial experiences that you have. Some of your first impressions, they take a lot to change those initial reactions. Confirmation bias, latching on to information that conforms to our beliefs. And affinity bias, we all have a bias for people who are like us. And sometimes it's pretty um, innocuous, like I'm connected to other parents, or I'm connected to people who are from Minnesota, 
even though I moved here from Minnesota and I was okay with leaving it behind. But when I see a Minnesotan, I go, hey, we're both from Minnesota, right? So um, we have that natural affinity bias. But sometimes that affinity bias is based on race and national origin and gender and sexual orientation as well. And so sort of being aware of that. I want to give, share a story with you about affinity bias. I'm sorry, anchoring bias. So I have a best friend, and she and I grew up kind of differently. Uh, so when I was a little kid, my mom was a machine operator, and she worked the second shift, and it was a really hard job, and she would take the city bus home at night. And I remember her coming home and telling us this story of her waiting for the city bus at around 11 o'clock at night, and this dog attacked her out of nowhere. And she said that this African-American man came out of nowhere and rescued her from that dog. Um, and I remember just having such warm feelings for this hero who had saved my mom from this. And I shared that story with a friend many, many years later, and she talked about her first experience being a little kid and um, going shopping with her mom and seeing her mom's purse get snatched by a group of African-American boys and um, beaten up and being so scared as a little kid. And we shared those stories, and we talked about it, and she openly sort of shared that sometimes when I see not one African-American male, but a group of African-American uh, 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 men, I still get like this feeling, she says. And that's really important. And I share these stories not to say that one is more true or accurate than the other, but that these stories that we first experience with people who are different from us stay with us a very, very long time. And if we're not willing to sort of dig deep into our history and recognize that, we don't have an explanation for that gut reaction, right? And we think that that gut reaction there is therefore truthful. So we want to really be thoughtful and mindful of that. I'm going to show you a video. These are the children in the picture. Marcy and Renee are in school together and they're in the hallway and I'd like you to tell me what you think is happening in this picture. She probably looks like she's going to steal it because Marcy's like, oh no, what happened? And mm -hmm. he's like, hey look, 20 bucks. <laughs> and so do you think that Renee is doing something good, bad, or um, just neutral? I think she... I don't, I think she's going to take the money. Do you think that Renee and Marcy are likely to be friends or not? Not really. And what do you think about Marcy's parents? Do you think they'd be comfortable with her being friends with Renee or not? Um, well, if they find out the situation that happened, they might be a little concerned about if Renee's a thief. Mm-hmm. And this one we have Erica and Allison, and they're also in the hallway at school. Can you tell me what it seems is happening in this picture? Allison looks like a sweet girl, mm -hmm. so I think that she would pick up Erica's money and give it back to her. Okay. So then, do you think Allison's doing something good, bad, or neutral? Um, pretty good. And what about Allison and Erica? Do you think they're probably friends or not so much? Yeah, they're probably friends. Okay. Do you think Erica's parents would like it if she was friends with Allison? Yeah. Her responses, according to our expert, Dr. Melanie Killen, could indicate a subconscious racial bias. A bias that kids develop from messages they hear at school, at home, the characters in the TV shows they watch, and what they see online. And Michaela's reversing the scenarios based on race wasn't unique. 24 percent, almost a quarter of all children, both white and African American, saw their own race more positively than the other race. And this happened across all ages and all school types, no matter the racial demographics. What do you think happened in this picture? Um, they got a poster. And what do you think is going to happen next? Brandon's going to hop over books. So do you think that Randy's doing something that's okay, not okay, or kind of in the middle? Not okay. Not okay? Was Andre doing something good, bad, or just okay? Good. Michaela's answers were very much in line with her. Michaela's parents, Jim and Jennifer, agreed to watch their daughter's test and talk about her responses. Um, well, if they find out the situation that happened, they might be a little concerned about if Renee's a thief. Mm -hmm. Allison looks like a sweet girl. Mm -hmm. So I think that she would pick up Erica's money and give it back to her. When you see that, what goes through your mind? I mean, is there a conversation you want to have with her? Is there stuff you want to know more about? I, I would definitely want to pursue that conversation with her and find out 
why her perception was different based upon the color of the, of the girl's skin. What changed in that scenario in her head? It's a teachable moment. It's a, you know, it's a realization like, well, maybe we have to do you know, a, a better job or uh, focus more on um, distinguishing like, uh, about racism and, and you know, the diversity and just um, influence our kids and, and let them know that you have to judge a person by their character, not their skin color. So what was going on there? <laughs> Thoughts? I think they already had uh, stimulated her um, bias. They meaning her, her parents? parents? Okay, yeah. all right. Other thoughts? Yes. She was learning from the culture, folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. A greater culture? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Other thoughts? Yeah. I think a lot of parents um, might be thinking the right things, but they don't convey it um, explicitly to their children. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're hoping or they're feeling like what they think they know is going to be absorbed by the kids, but I think children need mm -hmm. more direct input. Is uh, Michaela or her parents racist? Yeah? Okay. Other people say no? Well, they have biases, that's for sure. Yeah. I would say the answer to that question is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Michaela is racist or her family is racist or not. The result is the same, whether it's explicit bias or implicit bias. We spend a whole lot of time talking about you're calling me a racist, or I have the right to call you a racist. The, the answer is, the outcome is the same. If you don't want to hire somebody because they are a woman, or they are a transgender person, or because they're gay, or whatever the reason is. They're homeless. Sure, sure. Whatever the reason might be why you don't want to hire somebody, you're still not hiring them. And if you have implicit bias against any of those groups and you don't challenge them or you don't even give them the interview, the result is the same, right? And I would say that we need to stop having the conversation about the isms and who are we and because that actually is a hindrance to us addressing that implicit bias, even though it's unconscious, actually could have the same result as having explicit bias. So it doesn't matter. But I would also say here that this study was affinity bias based on race. Notice that the African American kids in this study also favored their in-group more than the white kids in the picture, right? This is a whole lot different from the black doll, white doll studies in yeah. the 1960s. You all remember those studies? Yeah. For those of you who don't, they sat kids, white kids and black kids, in front of two dolls, a white doll and a black doll, and they asked the kids to describe these dolls. And both kids described the white doll as being kind and beautiful and uh, nice and gave it a lot of positive attributes. But when they described the black doll, they said this was the ugly doll and the mean doll and, and gave it a lot of negative attributes. And what was particularly sad about those studies is that after the fact, they asked the kids, which one of these dolls is most like you? And the white kids, of course, said, oh, the white doll is like me. And the black kids, after they just attributed all of these negative characteristics about the black doll, said, that doll is like me. Right? which is very sad. And also it mirrors the studies called the Jewish hate studies after World War II, where a lot of people of uh, Jewish descent started to adopt what they had been hearing in the culture about themselves and started to hate themselves. Right. How do we measure implicit bias? Well, the most popular study is the Harvard Implicit Bias Study. How many people in here have taken that test? Okay. If you haven't, I would encourage you to do it. There's also other implicit bias studies that have been uh, like using MRI or using a way to test actually your hair and how your hair responds to pictures of different groups of people and so forth. But the most popular is the Harvard implicit bias test. And what it is is 
it's a time test because we know that implicit bias shows up in that part of the brain that is very fast acting and so this is a timed test and so you're asked to sort of categorize words and pictures you're told these are stereotypically european american faces these are stereotypically african american faces these are good words that are good and words that are bad and your job is to really just categorize that it's a time to exam you get a lot of practice runs at the beginning and then you do a stereotype congruent test first where you'll, sh you'll sh be shown a picture like this and you're clicking on, oh, it's European-American. You'll be shown a word like kind. Oh, that word means good. So you're clicking on that. And then you do a um, stereotype incongruent test where um, you're asked to do the same categorization, but now positive words are associated with African-Americans and European Americans are associated with negative words and you shouldn't there shouldn't be any lag in time in how you do this test so the idea is that you're categorizing these words and these pictures just as fast you should be as those words in those pictures but if there is a delay meaning you're spending time thinking about it it's suggestive that you might have implicit bias and this study has been connected to actual disparate treatment by participants. So people who score high in implicit bias actually do treat people differently than those who score lower. And this study has also been um, replicated in terms of national origin and weight and other categories as well. So uh, disability, so I would encourage you to go to the Harvard Implicit Bias website and to read more and then to, if you're nervous about it, just do it privately and don't tell anybody about it. And you know, I, because I know that some of you probably are a little bit nervous about it. I, I, I'm sure I'm nervous about it sometimes too, but you have to sort of like, hey, what is it gonna tell me? I need to know this and this is important. All right, so here's an example. The red line is represent, represents explicit bias and the blue line represents implicit bias. So um, when they asked participants whether they had any bias against people with disabilities, a very small percentage, probably 2% of the people said, yeah, right? But we have close to almost 25% of people testing high and having implicit bias for people, against people with disabilities. Same is true for blacks. Here we have 10% who might admit that they have implicit bias against black people, but here almost 40 plus percent uh, they have implicit bias. Notice that the two lines are much closer together when it comes to gay, lesbian, and legal immigrants. Why is that? Why are our implicit and our explicit biases much, closely, much more closely aligned when it comes to these two groups of people? Any thoughts about that? I think people are more comfortable admitting it. Sure, yeah. sure, they're more comfortable admitting it. There's probably some more social acceptability around it. Um, if I said to you I don't believe in interracial relationships, mm -hmm. I think, I hope most of us would go, what the heck is wrong with you? It's like that sounds really racist. But if I said I don't believe in same sex marriages or relationships, there might be some people that go, oh, okay. Some of us would be like, oh, that's awful. And some of us would go, well, you know, that's your religion, that's your philosophy, that's the way you grew up, that's okay. So there's more social acceptability to having those conversations. Likewise, legal immigration has always been a hot topic. It is a topic that people talk about all the time. We didn't like the Italians. We didn't like the Irish. Uh, when um, Americans were surveyed after World War II about whether or not uh, Jewish immigrants and refugees should be allowed into the United States, most of those participants said no. Oh. Okay. So, and now the conversation has just changed to a different immigrant group. But the reality is that immigration has always been a hot topic that people feel very openly biased in for or against. Except for when the Indians were the ones who were <laughs> making the decisions about who was coming. <laughs> save, save that thought for later because we're short on time, but yes. What's gender value? What, I don't gender, know. gender, yes, yeah. 
There are many studies that document implicit bias in nearly every aspect of life. Height. We have an implicit bias against uh, or about height. Okay. What percentage of American men are over six feet tall? Take a guess. 30, 10, 9, 4, okay, relatively small numbers, right? 15%, okay, 15%. What percentage of corporate CEOs are over six feet tall? Yeah, yeah, like what? 90, 80, okay, 60, 60%. What about U.S. presidents? This is true of U.S. presidents. In fact, the last time we had a U.S. president that was average height or below average height was, I think, William McKinley in 18, uh, 1896, I want to say, and he was assassinated. Assassinated. Not that that's connected. I just thought I'd share that fact. Yes. Uh, I just thought. But this, this is true for admirals and people in the military as well. Okay. Where does this bias come from about height? <coughs> yes. Also. Evolution. Evolution? Okay. I think we are still that, that inner brain. Yeah. The amygdala sure. is influenced by our evolutionary history. Sure. And there's this bias that's sure. Height, easier, yeah. yeah. Height strength. is strength. Yeah, we have sayings like "I like we look like to look up to people" and so forth. Mind you, this is not about women. We don't feel the same way about women who are over six feet tall, the way we feel about men who are over six feet tall. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I love Brianna Tarr. We also have an implicit bias based on socioeconomic status. These pictures are actually from an experiment where they had a little girl dress up as uh, having some, someone who has a little bit more money or having not as much money. And they had her act as if she was lost. And there was a huge difference in people's reaction to her. If she looked like she had more money, people uh, approached her and said, hey, are you lost? They showed her compassion and kindness. And over here, they ignored her. Okay. Very few people approached her. And ultimately, even when she asked for help sometimes, they were like, oh, get away from me. Okay. I want to tell you about a study involving um, a fictitious person called Hannah, where they asked these participants to guess at whether or not Hannah is smart or not smart based on some information about her being rich or poor. And most participants said, you can't tell whether someone's smart or not based on the, her being rich or poor. That's just not enough information, right? Like whether she gets free or reduced lunch or she doesn't. That, that, that's not inf enough information to tell whether someone's uh, smart or not. So then they had the participants watch a 20 minute video of um, Hannah answering some questions. And then they had the participants evaluate whether or not Hannah was smart or not smart based on that video. Okay. And what they didn't realize is that everybody watched the same video. And the only difference between participants is they were told that Hannah was rich to begin with or Hannah was poor and that the video was designed to be ambiguous. And so those who were told that Hannah was rich to begin with watched that video and said, she's smart. And those who were told that Hannah was poor watched that video and said, well, based on this video, I, she's not smart. Right? Yeah. We know that there's an implicit bias in terms of names. Job applicants with names associated with whites receive a call back for one of every 10 resumes. Names associated with blacks were one in 15. If your name is Carrie and Kristen, you might get a callback rate of more than 13%, but Aisha, <coughs> Keisha, or Tamika, less. The study has been replicated be uh, based on gender. Men get more callbacks than women do, and also uh, names that sound more stereotypically foreign, like Jose versus Joe as well. And the resume is the same. 
That's really important. The resume is exactly the same, identical in qualifications, so that the only variable here is the name. Okay. This is really important if we are ever in a position where we're on the hiring committee and we don't even realize that we might be evaluating someone, not based on what shows up under education or experience, but the first thing, which is their name, and sometimes where they live, and so forth. Yes? I was the director of a graduate program at mm -hmm. North University, and I forbade anybody on the evaluation committee from seeing a picture or getting a gender identification, and the names were random numbers. Yeah, that's great. That was yeah. deliberately because of this kind of study. Sure, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. If sometimes we have a bias in Vermont where we, we think that if people are applying from outside Vermont, they might not stay. So we only want to hire people with a Vermont address. If you do that, you're skewing in favor of white people. Yes. I told myself I wasn't going to speak today. But yes. <laughs> but you have to. I just yes. to say that part of the reason I applied for my job is because I didn't think I'd get it because I'm not from Vermont. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and when I was, um, so I've been a long time renter in Vermont. And with, every time I rent, uh, my husband does other stuff. So he's not the one approaching landlords and rental managers. I'm the one doing it. I, my name sounds very foreign, stereotypically foreign. So I always say, and my husband is white. So I always say, Bohr and Christopher, even though it's really just the email is from me because I'm like, I need a place to live and I don't want to deal with bias right now. And so it's just like, so I, we're very cognizant of that. But that, that's really important. So whatever stereotypes we have about people outside of Vermont and inside Vermont, those things tend to skew. Likewise, housing discrimination is very prevalent in Vermont, but it's really hard to detect. And part of that is, one, it's, it's scarce. Housing is very scarce in Vermont. So if you have a landlord or a rental manager who doesn't want to rent to children, well, you have nine other single couples who are also renting. And so you never catch that bias, that explicit bias. And the other reason why uh, um, housing discrimination is very hard to detect in Vermont is because people rent through word of mouth. Most people don't even advertise. And so if you're renting through word of mouth, think for a second about who your friends and who your family members are and how you might already be skewing who can get in your housing if you're renting, renting through word of mouth. Changing a hurricane's name from male to female nearly triples the storm's fatalities. What? Exactly, what? Okay, so let me give you some background. These researchers these researchers wanted to look at fatalities of hurricanes, and they went back in history and they looked, and they found that when the hurricane had a female name, there were three times the amount of deaths than when a hurricane had a male name. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know, hurricane names are provided way in advance, so we're not talking about the bias of meteorologists here, right? Uh, so what could explain this phenomenon? <laughs> yes, yes. So the researchers was like, is that a possibility that people are actually judging hurricanes based on the names? So then they had a subsequent study in which they had these participants uh, sit down and try to guess or evaluate and rank hurricanes just based on names alone. And it was true that when the hurricane had a female name, they rated it as less severe, low, than when a hurricane had a male name. Mind you, before we're really judgmental of these Floridians and these people who live in the coast, this is unconscious. It's also an ambiguous situation because it costs money. If you live on the coast, it costs money to leave, and sometimes the, hur the meteorologists are wrong. The hurricane doesn't actually hit. And so you're like, should I go, should I not? It's a last minute decision, time constraints, it's very ambiguous. And they're making decisions without even realizing that they might be judging it. In fact, 
by the way, in case you're concerned, they removed a couple of hurricanes, just not to skew the data, like her Katrina, and I think it was Irene. But, um, but uh, if, if the hurricane had an especially stereotypically feminine name, like Dolly or Cindy, that there were even more fatalities. Wow. Yes. That we're judging the strength of hurricanes based on what it is called. Yes. So I noticed this year that they've been trying to do more gender neutral names. Is that part of this? I don't know, but I don't know. That's really interesting. We should ask. Yes. That would be like, what is it? What are some of the new names? Do you know? I honestly don't remember. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would simply put some random syllables together. Yeah. yeah, but or or we could be aware of our implicit biases. <laughs> okay, yes. So instead of fixing the hurricane name issue, we can all be like, hey, what's going on here? How do we feel about women? Okay, why why is this doing this? Okay, just a suggestion. <laughs> yes. I always thought women named hurricanes would be worse because you know women are um, uh, accused of being hysterical so much more than men. Sure, but that might be conscious. Unconscious might be different from that. Yeah. yeah. Remember that unconscious is not necessarily connected to how we really feel about a group of people. You know, you might have a unconscious bias that African Americans are connected to crime but really like African Americans. Mm -hmm. You might have an unconscious bias that Asian Americans are really good at math but in fact hate them or dislike them, right? Mm -hmm. Resent them. Okay. So it's not connected. So yes, you might have a conscious bias that women <laughs> are this way but unconsciously still think they're weak. Identical applications for a science lab assistant were sent to faculty at various institutions. Applicants with male names were offered the position more often, offered more mentoring opportunities, offered thousands more in salary than identically qualified women. And both, this is important, both male and female faculty rated applicants similarly. Okay. Bias is not a phenomenon of the white, straight, cisgender male you are not immune from bias because you belong in a protected category. We all have to be conscious of it, including myself. And my job every day is to think and talk about bias, right? And that's because, like you mentioned earlier, Michaela, remember Michaela? There is a culture and an entire climate here that impacts Michaela here. What is she watching on TV? What does she read in the newspapers? What is available to her at the local libraries? Right. So when I take my kids into a bookstore, um, they're Asian American. There are very few books with Asian American characters on them. Very few. And if there are, it's one, it's a story, it's one story. So like if one kid happens to really be into princesses and another kid is really into superheroes, well, I, I probably won't find a book in either of those genre for my kids to, so that they could be represented in the book. So mind you, that is available to all of us, right? Those are, we're watching the same movies on Netflix, but which by the way is getting much more diverse Netflix, yay Netflix, right? But we're watching the same movies, we're subject to the same books, the same textbook, we learn from the same ones in the United States, and so this is a phenomenon that is impacting all of us. And this is a very interesting fact to keep in mind. Another example regarding gender bias, participants are asked to evaluate two finalists for a police chief position a male and a female, and one candidate's profile was sing uh, signaled streetwise and the other book smart, meaning they had a lot of experience on the street. And so it showed that they had done a lot of work and so forth. And then the other candidate had, was considered book smart, lots of high education and so forth. And they vary which profile attached to the woman and to the man. Regardless of which attributes the male candidate featured, Participants favored the male candidate and articulated their hiring criteria accordingly. Okay. 
um, when the man had higher education, they preferred him 70% of the time. When the woman had higher education, they only preferred her only 22% of the time. What counted as merit was redefined in real time to justify hiring the man. So education sounds like it's really important, but actually only when the candidate that we actually like has it. Even the attributes of being family oriented and having children was deemed more important when the man had it. Because if a man has a wife and kids, well, he's responsible. If a woman has a husband and kids, she's a risk. She's a liability. She may not come to work sometimes. But he, he's a responsible person. Yes. The same attributes of men and of women are consistently interpreted negatively for the women who right. have the same attributes. Yes. That's absolutely yes. consistent across our society. In much of these studies, they asked people to describe the female applicant, and they would uh, the participants used really great words like competitive and ambitious and um, um, I'm, I'm blanking, but um, ambitious, competitive, leader. Uh, leader, really positive attributes, and they still chose the man. So the same attributes that make us like a male candidate are not the same attributes that make us like a female candidate. Right? Just like that height that I told you. We like men who are tall, perhaps. We don't necessarily like women who are tall. Although I don't think we like women who are short, short either. Uh, who knows? We just can't get it right. Who knows what that magic height is for women? There is none. I'm going to show you a video. This afternoon, we're going to draw people doing different jobs. And the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter. Okay. Have a think in your head what a firefighter looks like. Oh, okay. What's your firefighter called? Mine's called Firefighter Gary. Firefighter Stan. <laughs> firefighter Simon. He's big and strong. He's got a big helmet on. That's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim Bob. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. Yes. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah. My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? <gasps> Who's putting it on? I'm trying my stethoscope. Oh, we put this in here. What does it look like? There you go. Now you're a proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's really Mine's good. Much better, yeah, yeah, it's much better than my kids' Mine's one. Got Thoughts? Absolutely. No, that's, that's like the joke where you tell, you know, the, um, the, there was an accident and somebody uh, was, and his father was killed. Oh, right, yes, out. yeah, I remember that. He goes yes. to the hospital and, yes. he, and uh, he right. says, that's my mother. Right, so yes. yes. Uh, um, the video tells us that so. these stereotypes about gender show up at ages five through seven. So we're talking first grade, sec kindergarten, first grade, second grade, right? We can tell the little girls that they can be anything they want, but they're, not, they're getting a completely different message elsewhere. This video is very recent. This is a recent video. It's not from the 1970s, right? That's really important to keep that in mind about when stereotypes start about people. Yes? Um, these two examples can be called male-oriented chief of police, like that job is stereotypically a male role, 
and the position that they have here were also stereotypical of men. And the implicit bias that makes us all think that that man would fill that role also hurts men. In sure. Absolutely. Of being trapped in those sorts of roles. Sure. And, and, yes. And uh, that women, you know, maybe don't see themselves in that role, but men have to see themselves. Sure. Absolutely. Role. Yes. I think that's absolutely I true. Think that's across the board with the um, impact of you know racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. stereotypes exactly. And yeah. Just, um, yeah. Important. It's been important for me as a cisgender male. Mm -hmm. um, a privileged class to recognize where I am disadvantaged by my own bias. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just sharing um, with some friends the other day that being introducing yourself and your pronouns is, has been so helpful to me, whose name is Bohr, because I've always been called Mr. Yang, right? <laughs> Uh, because people don't know whether boy is a male or a female name. And when you're inclusive, uh, even though you think you might be doing it for one group, you're actually including a lot more people. So gender stereotypes hurt, does hurt everybody. And likewise, I also teach when we talk about fair housing laws, is that you think you're putting in the ramp for the one person in the wheelchair, but that's not true. That ramp actually helps the person who's pregnant, that helps the delivery person, that helps anybody else who's carrying groceries and need a, needs an automatic door. That ramp is inclusive of everybody. And keeping that in mind. So when we're inclusive, it's for everyone's sake. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. We know in Vermont that discipline is um, exercised differently based on who the students are. Students with disabilities are three times more likely than students without disabilities to be suspended. African American and Native American students two times to three times more likely than white students to be suspended. The use of the exclusionary discipline, restraint, seclusion, referral to law enforcement and school related arrests varies widely across schools in the state of Vermont. We know that discipline is connected to incarceration. A Johns Hopkins study showed that students suspended just one time in the ninth grade double the risk of dropping out. Other studies have shown that disciplinary removal increases the likelihood of contact with the juvenile justice system by threefold. And ha other studies that connect dropout rates to even a greater likelihood of incarceration as an adult and higher poverty rates. This tells us a lot about what we should be doing in schools. So even though we're making decisions about discipline, that decision actually impacts our decisions later about jails and prisons in Vermont and police practices and so forth. It is all connected. The lifetime likelihood of imprisonment, men versus women, white men versus black man, men and Latino men, Etc. Doctors uh, are more likely to recommend a heart catheterization to white patients than to black patients who show the same identical conditions. Uh, and the heart catheterization procedure is less invasive and less costly. Black scented bargain for used car were offered prices $700 higher and got fewer concessions. Think identically qualified whites. Mm -hmm. Identically qualified African Americans were shown fewer apartments and houses for sale than whites. And on eBay, iPods that were held by white hands received 21% more offers than those held in black hands. We have no face, no clothing, just a hand holding an iPod. Mm -hmm. We know that bi there's bias in courtrooms, there's bias against judges, there's bias that judges have. Um, if you're bringing an employment discrimination case, you're more likely to lose at every stage of litigation compared to any other civil case. Plaintiffs prevail in pretrial motions only 4% of the time versus 22% of other types of civil plaintiffs and so forth. And it goes all the way down to victories that are appealed as well. How we evaluate the credibility of evidence is determined or impact, our implicit bias impacts how we look at evidence as well. 
in a mock jury study where people were showed five photographs of a crime scene, including a surveillance camera photo that featured a masked gunman whose hand and forearm were visible. The arm was dark or it was light. So you didn't see the face, only the arm, and that arm was either dark or light. Jurors evaluated how credible was this evidence and how guilty is the defendant. They were more likely to evaluate the evidence as more credible and find the defendant guilty if the skin was darker. So we have the same surveillance photograph and we find it to be much more credible if the skin is dark than if the skin is light. When the standard is preponderance of the evidence, which is the standard in all civil cases, we are more likely to skew in favor of those who are in our in-group. Okay, and this is important because we often have that affinity bias, but then we have to look at the makeup of our legislature and the makeup of our judges. If people are making decisions based on affinity bias, if our judges are mostly white male, and if our legislature is mostly white also, then that changes who is being heard by our legislature and our judges. Yes? Remember the case a few years ago about the white rich kid who was declared really not so guilty. I and mean, it was his fault. It was the parents' fault because he was spoiled. After you, right. Thank yes. You. Yes. That's yeah. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Yes. Astounding. Yes. There were three experiments at the University of Arizona. They randomly assigned participants to view male or female attorney presenting the same closing argument in a neutral or angry tone and they reported their impressions of the attorney and how likely they would be to hire the attorney. Well, of course, they, they reacted significantly more favorably to male attorneys who expressed anger compared to when they were calm, less favorably to female attorneys who expressed anger compared to when they were calm, and female attorneys who were seen as significantly less effective, while angry male attorneys were seen as significantly more effective. So you can't, even be, you can't be tall, can't be too short, and you can't be too angry too, women, okay? Because the same things that we like in men, right? We might like a really aggressive lawyer who is really angry in the courtroom and they're doing their closing argument. We don't like women to show anger in the courtroom in the same way. Around half of all women lawyers uh, reported that credit for their contribution was stolen by somebody else. 80% of white men as opposed to 63% of white women, 59% of men of color, 53% of women of color reported that they had equal opportunities for high quality assignments. Women lawyers of color were eight times more likely than white men to report that they had been mistaken for janitorial staff, administrative staff, or court personnel. I have a story too. Oh. Do you have? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's hear yours. Female lawyers of color unite, right? Yeah. Uh, two days ago, I was uh, mistaken for an Uber driver when two white men tried to climb into my car. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. And what's funny, I mean, so much of this is really tragically hilarious, but what's funny about it is that the car they ended up actually getting into looked nothing like mine. Yeah. But you see a person of color sure. roll up in a shiny black car, and you think they're there at your service. Wow. Well, what did you say to them? Oh. I said, I'm yeah. not your ride. Right, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm really sorry that that happened. Yeah. That's terrible. Um, so my predecessor, some of you might know her, Karen, and she uh, is a white woman. And uh, I, uh, as Susanna mentioned, I was a staff attorney at the Human Rights Commission and when Karen was the executive director. And she and I were on our way to a meeting at a very secured building to talk about a case that I had investigated, okay, and closed. And we were going there and you have to go through a security system. And it turns out that if you are a lawyer, you get to keep your phone. And if you're a non-lawyer, they take your phone from you. So Karen and I are going through the security system. Karen doesn't remember what the rules was. So Karen goes, oh, do you need to take my phone? And they go, oh, no, no, not, not if you're a lawyer, right? So I go by and they go, we need your phone. And I go, I'm a lawyer too. They're like, oh, OK. Real nice, really nice people. OK, I just want to say that. They were very kind. So, okay, well, it is what it is. So we walk through, no big deal. We go upstairs, we go in, and there's two books to sign in. Lawyers, for lawyers, for non-lawyers. Yeah. I'm a lawyer, so I look at the lawyer book, and I go, okay, I'm going to sign in under this book. And the lady stops me, and she goes, oh, uh, do you, I think you might want to sign. And then I go, 
She looks at Karen for permission. <laughs> and I go, well, she's looking at Karen like, are you guys, uh, we're both lawyers, right? So I say this, or I forgot, Karen says this. So we correct her. She's like, oh, OK, really nice. So we sign in under the book. We go to our meeting. We come out. It's past 4.30. So the only book left to sign out of is the lawyer book, which is fine. That's the book that I signed in under. There's a new person at the front desk now. And he, I see the book, I get ready to sign out, and he goes, you must have signed in under the other book. Oh. Let me grab that for you. Oh. Three times in two hours, there was this belief by three different people that Karen was a lawyer, but I wasn't. Nobody ever asked for our ID. It's not like you have to show your lawyer ID to anybody, and if you do, oh. your picture's not on it. So it's not like they would even know. But there was sort of this, maybe she's a lawyer, and maybe she's not. Had Karen walked through that entire process by herself, I don't think she would have noticed anything. right? And had I done it, I might have questioned myself for three days thereafter and gone, I'm having a bad hair day. Maybe it's something I was wearing. Maybe there was dirt. Maybe I don't look like a lawyer that day. Who knows? But because we were similarly dressed, right? And nobody in that law office, by the way, wears suits, OK? <laughs> Unless they're going to court. So um, we were similarly dressed. And because we had the benefit of comparing yeah. side by side every step of the way, that we were able to see that implicit bias was there. But most of the time, we don't get the benefit of that comparison. And so we go through life, and, and many of us who experience implicit bias goes, was that it or was that not? I think it was it, but oh, uh, you know? And most white people, I would say, who experience that never notice that they have experienced a benefit at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yes? Boyfriend. Mm. And he was the yeah. oldest out of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One of my dear friends, consultant in security, years of experience, arrives in a three piece suit at a building in New York City, and the security guard forced him into the freight elevator. Mm. The client found out about it and had the guard fired. Mm. That's explicit right. bias. Right. Disgusting. Yeah. What are the factors that affect processing? Um, ambiguous or incomplete information, compromised cognitive load, time constraints, and overconfidence and objectivity. So remember that hurricane ex study? Well, they were dealing with ambiguous or incomplete information. You're just not sure. So when, and remember the study on Hannah and watching the ambiguous 10 minute or 20 minute video of her answering questions? When we don't have information, our bias tends to show up more to try to interpret that ambiguous information. Likewise, time constraints and compromised cognitive load is really important. If you're really busy, your implicit bias is going to show up more than if you have time to think and use your neocortex and so forth. Our police officers under major time constraints when they're pulling somebody over by the side of the road. Right? Part of the training for uh, police officers is take a minute to take a deep breath before you step out of the car. Okay? That's really important because they are always operating under compromised cognitive load when they're on the road. And so implicit bias is going to show up a lot more because of that. And overconfidence and objectivity. If you think that you are colorblind and that you never see color, you never see gender, you always treat everybody fairly, then you're actually less likely able to, to address implicit bias. Okay. Having a willingness to be uncomfortable and say, might I have implicit bias? Maybe I should take this Harvard implicit bias test, and maybe I should go to this implicit bias training tonight from 6.30 to 8.30 at, uh, at the library, says, you know, maybe. It's, it's a willingness to have a discussion about implicit bias, and that's really important because you can, in fact, eliminate one of the big factors that affect your processes. 
I'm going to do a series of uh, little exercises about whether we can trust our perceptions truly. Okay. So I'm going to uh, click on this, and the arrow is going to go down. I'm going to ask all of you to say the color of the text out loud. Remember here, you're not reading the word. I was, I was like, you're saying the color. You're identifying the color. Yes? Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So let's try it. We're going to do it out loud together. Yes? Green, blue, red. Yeah. Good job. Should we try? <laughs> was that sarcastic? Okay. Let's do that again. Okay. Let's do it again. I'll give you another fair shot. Okay? Go. Green, blue, red, black, purple, green, green, brown. Okay. Let's do it. Now we're going to do it. It's going to be a little bit harder. You ready? Yes. You failed miserably. You failed miserably. Well, why did I have you do this? Why did I make you do this? Thoughts? Two competing things that you're trying to configure in your brain at the same time. Sure, yeah, two competing things. What did you want to do more of? Read the words, right? So if I had, if I had a bunch of little kids, four-year-olds, three-year-olds do this, they'd probably accomplish it because they navigate the world in, no offense, <laughs> they, they navigate the world through colors, not necessarily through reading. But as adults, we don't really do that anymore. And our default is always read, 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 read. And um, I also wanted to demonstrate here that under time constraints, your default is to do the thing you want to do. And it is really hard. If I had given you all the time in the world, you probably would have accomplished this task as well. right? But I didn't. And so it's sort of a demonstration, an easy demonstration of time constraints and where our defaults and our biases usually are, which is to read. Right? If you had listed the colors in Russian, you would have done really well. Yeah. Oh, OK, yes, yes. I'm going to have you listen to something and try to make sense of it. Okay, play it again. Any guesses? R2D2. R2D2, yeah, window. Okay. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. Oh. Yeah. What was the purpose of this exercise? The guesses, other than to give us a break from all the really sad studies. <laughs> True. Yeah, so you're dealing with ambiguous information. You have no storage in your brains to interpret it, right? You don't know what to make sense of it. But this is how quick the brain works. As soon as you hear something, you can now interpret the ambiguous information. Mind you, the ambiguous information hasn't become less ambiguous. It is still equally ambiguous. But we have something in our brains that tells us, hey, this is how I make sense of this now. That's how fast it's happening. right? So we have to be thinking about, what have I watched? What have I read? What are all those things I've learned? Because we're using that constantly to interpret an ambiguous situation. Like in Susanna's ex example of, why are you the Uber driver? Right? Where, what was in those men's brains about what makes you? Where have they read that or heard that or listened to in all their years that made them look at you in your vehicle and go, you must be the driver? As opposed to the executive director of racial equity for the state of Vermont. And, and the question right? I have is, what made you realize that they were looking for a driver? Did, did they say that or did, the, did you, did you say you're not their driver? That's an excellent point because they didn't say it. Yeah. I pulled out, by the way, this happened on MLK Day. It really wasn't. Oh, <laughs> man. I pulled up in front of a hotel where I had been staying with my companion, and I was expecting my companion to come out into the vehicle. But instead, when I pulled up, these two people came out, 
And yeah. I actually noticed them because uh, they kind of half smiled at me when they came out. And I thought, okay, friendly strangers. <laughs> and they were walking a little close to my car. And I'm like, uh, don't scrape it or anything in my head. And, <laughs> yeah. and then the one goes around the back and starts opening my trunk. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. And the other yeah. one with the hand on the back door handle. Yeah. 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 But you're, it's an excellent observation because nothing told me explicitly that they were looking for their driver. I assumed yeah. that sure. strangers yeah. entering my car looking at a right. phone, that's, that's yeah. 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 It turns out that optical illusions actually, you know, uh, explain a lot about how implicit bias works. Oftentimes, we use context and other information to explain something that looks like it doesn't make sense and to make sense of things. So for example, these two table services are actually the same. It, yes, yes. If we had time, I'd have you do a little exercise, but we don't. Uh, the monster in the back is actually the same size as the monster in the front. Yes. These two center circles are exactly the same. Okay. These two lines in the center are exactly the same length. And you'll notice here that there are multiple red colors here. And in fact, they're all the same color shade of red. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. So even the BI is the same color as the AS, which is also the same color that shows up in the banner here. Susan Fisk, a Princeton University a professor, did a study using an MRI scanner to observe people's brain activities when they were looking at pictures of people. And so what she did was she would show them pictures of tables and chairs and pretty much inanimate objects. And she would see that the brain really wasn't very stimulated by that, particularly the part of the brain that associates with compassion and people and so forth. And then she showed them pictures of uh, professionals, lawyers and doctors and so forth. And then she saw that the brain, well, was really stimulated by those pictures. And um, then she showed them pictures of homeless people and drug addicts to see whether their brain activity was more like the way that our brain would activate with pictures of professionals or pictures of tables and chairs. And what do you think she found? Yeah, tables and chairs. Yes that people's brains were stimulated in the same way when they're looking at pictures of tables and chairs. Why is that? Shouldn't we be more compassionate towards people who are homeless or are suffering from drug addiction? Why is it that we see them no, no more than tables or chairs, cars? Because it's them, not us. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, we're de yes. We, we dehumanize them, exactly. In fact, it's a phenomenon that shows up during wartime, where in order to pick up arms and bomb countries and stuff, we have to dehumanize others. But I would say that we don't do a very effective job, actually, of dehumanizing, because our soldiers come back with PTSD. Yeah. Yeah, for many, many, many years after that. Any other thoughts or questions about that? There was even a little experiment where they had family members dress up as homeless people sitting on by the side of the road, and then their family members would walk by them, and they wouldn't even yes. notice yes. them. Yeah. 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 Um, I worked someplace where they brought the prisoners in for um, breathing treatments, mm -hmm. and I never really knew whether to say hello to them or pretend I didn't notice them. Yeah. So I didn't know which... Sure. And therefore, I was sort of cutting them off, though, cutting off their sure. humanity also. Yeah. And if they weren't a prisoner, you probably wouldn't have questioned whether to say hello or not, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It also explains a lot of the things that happen at uh, the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. because we have a mentality of punishment in corrections that is hard for corrections to look at someone as someone who has mental health issues, right? Mm -hmm. We did yeah. some cases at the Human Rights Commission involving people who had severe mental health issues who were segregated for lo prolonged periods of time. I, we have one story of a gentleman who uh, was in his late 60s, he had <coughs> dementia, and the only thing he had done to get uh, in prison was he spat at a police officer. Mm -hmm. 
So then they arrested him and they set bail. He couldn't make bail. Some paperwork got lost. He was sitting in prison because he was waiting a mental health evaluation. And he, um, there was no room at the hospital beds. After Hurricane Irene, there were, uh, like, we were short on hospital beds. So you know what happens? You go to prison, by the way. Okay? So you have dementia, you end up in prison, and corrections don't know how to deal with someone with dementia who's looking for an evaluation. And so he keeps acting out, and they keep seeing that as more need to punish him, and then he ends up, they segregate him for 14 days. Okay. Now, segregation is not, oh, you're alone in a nice room by yourself. It is you might not get more than an hour of daylight right. per day. You're getting your food there. And of course, if you have any mental health issues, that makes it that much worse. Okay. So this is important because if we dehumanize people because they're prisoners or otherwise, then we're not going to get them the services that they need, and we're not going to treat them with the respect that they need. And then we have all these other problems that happens, which I'm not going to go into because press is here. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. So processing information. The characteristics that we attribute to people come from stereotypes, institutional bias, of course, press, movies, lack of contact with people who are different from us, and of course, history, our personal history, our familial history, and our national history as well. Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the um, pardon me. That's quite pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> okay. What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. Because yes, people assumed that his wife was the nanny. Thousands of commenters were like, that nanny's in trouble. Oh, that nanny's going to get fired and so forth. It's 2020. Interracial relationships have been here since forever. And yet we still have an idea about what the mom would look like and what the nanny would look like as well. Okay, stereotypes. We have a really difficult history that we can't even all go into about slavery and women as property of men, taking land from Native Americans. Our US immigration laws were really, really racist just up until recently. We had laws at one point that said you could only come into this country if you were white. And then we had laws that says you could only become, come into this country if you could be a US citizen, but you could only be a US citizen if you were white. And then up until the mid-1980s, we had laws that says the percentage of people we allowed into this country depended on the percentage of people who are already here from those various countries, which again was skewing more white, white and so forth. So if we are a state or a nation that is mostly white, it didn't happen naturally. It happened because of a very hard and racist history with racist laws and racist policies. And that's why we've come to be the way that we are. And that's really important to keep in mind. Paying women for uh, less for the same job, that is still true. Um, denial of the right to vote to blacks and women. Uh, Jim Crow and segregation in housing, places of public accommodations and education, separate but equal. Again, all of this history still informs the way that our minds think today. ERA. Institutional media bias is really important here. We know that the media has an incentive to be fast and create eye-catching headlines. If you lean more liberal, where are you getting your news? Democracy now, yeah. Okay, maybe NBC, maybe CNN, maybe NPR, maybe. If you lean more conservative, where do you get your news? Fox, okay. Why should that be the case, right? The, um, if we see kids with um, brown skin 
um, committing vandalism the same way we see white kids committing vandalism, we might see different words used for them. Protests and out of control fans versus riots and looting. Um, or we're really quick to call something or someone a terrorist before the police have even finished the investigation. But if it's a white person, they're mentally ill, something is wrong with them as the individual, not their group of people. Right. This is the same crime, the same day, in the same news station. Now remember that story I told you about me and Karen? We have the benefit today of looking at this side by side. Normally when you open a newspaper, you're, or you're reading it online, you're not going to have this benefit. You're reading something and then you, cl you click away and then it's done. Today we get to evaluate this. So here we have three white men, three University of Iowa wrestlers arrested, burglary charges pending. Here, Coralville police arrest for a burglary investigation. What's the difference? So, one person at a time. Mug shots. Okay, yeah, mug shots. Fraternity shot. Pending? Yeah, pending. What else? Say, say that? There was a lot of... University of Iowa. They get an identity. They're just four. Not they get a noun at all. Yeah, yes, exactly. And we don't know that none of these guys work or are students at the same university. Right? Right? But what if, if you're, so we know that there's differences between these pictures, identity, no identity, uh, pending, not pending, muck shots, nice little pictures of you in your ties. Like what might this say to you? If we're really going to go there, what might this say to us about these groups of people? Structural racism. Guilty, Guilty? Yeah. criminals, yeah. right? This yeah. is the same old, same old, by the way. This is a surprising story about uh, these three guys who you wouldn't expect to commit burglary, but they did. That's the storyline. This storyline is, yeah, 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 this always happens. And this storyline is, surprise! Okay. Now, just in case you thought that they didn't have bug shots for these guys, they have done some studies with the media where they had access to social media accounts and they had hundreds and thousands of pictures available to them. They still pick more menacing pictures for black men and they pick the more nicer looking pictures for the white men because the story is still selling the surprise. Oh. And the story is still selling, yeah, this is who he is. This is who he always is, right? Was it? Yes. That Lee Harris, <laughs> we should write them. <laughs> These two nearly identical photos. Uh, thank you. These two nearly identical photos with very different captions appeared almost simultaneously. Here we have a kid who has darker skin. Here we have two adults who have lighter skin. The reading over here, I'll read it for you in case you have trouble. A young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. Flood waters continue to rise in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina did extensive damage, etc. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding um, bread and soda, soda yeah, right. from a local grocery store. From a local grocery oh, store, yeah. after Hurricane Katrina came through the area in New Orleans, Louisiana. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Right now, mind you, that the the media may not even know that they're using these words. They may not even know that they have an implicit bias. That they chose the word looting versus the word finding. And then we're like digesting it as if it's also true without even processing the words that have been provided to us, right? So here, looting is you're stealing. You don't deserve compassion. I may not even donate to the relief. Here, oh, you're so desperate. And you're, you're finding it inside a grocery store, though. But you're finding it. And so, and by the way, they all deserve compassion. This is a hurricane, OK? After all, yeah. and they probably didn't leave because it was a female name. <laughs> okay? Yes. But here, again, they're getting a lot more compassion, right? This means that they're desperate, they're finding it, and so forth. I seriously doubt that the, the, the media that took a picture of this went down there and interviewed these people and said, hey, did you steal that or did you find that? 
Okay. So very Im important. These pictures are being taken from above. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. We can't talk about implicit bias unless we also talk about privilege. Okay. And of course, we're not going to give it the, the time that it deserves today, but we have to talk about privilege. What is privilege? There are many forms of it. What does it look like? What does it mean? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> So obviously, there's a privilege about being able-bodied versus being a person with a disability, right? If you're able-bodied, you have the privilege of being able to access any building that you want. We know that the ADA is in place, but there's a lot of buildings that are older in Vermont that are outside of those requirements. So if I want to go and have a drink with my colleagues after work, which we don't, but if I do, um, I like, and if I were in a wheelchair, I might go, uh, can I get in the building? Okay. Am I going to be embarrassed today? But if you're able-bodied, that's not something that ever crosses your mind. You're thinking about appetizers and drinks and who's got the best deals and so forth. Right? Uh, we had a couple that came all the way from Pennsylvania to Stowe, and they had a service animal. And they went to the trouble of calling ahead of time to say, this is a service animal. I just want to make sure it's going to be OK, la, la, la. After a lot of discussion, the hotel is like, OK, fine. They show up, the hotel goes, no, 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 I don't know who you talk to, but you can't stay here unless you pay so much money as a deposit. And they say, you can't do that, that's against the law. And the hotel goes, yeah, too bad. So they call the police, the police show up, and the police goes, yeah, you can't do that, that's against the law. And uh, they go, yeah, too bad. Whoa. Mm -hmm. The police wow. goes, well, it's not a crime, I can't arrest anybody, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a crime. Against the law, but it's yes. Not a crime. Well, uh, but you, you can have a violation of a civil ordinance or statute, but yeah. So there's criminal law and civil law, which we can't get into. But yes, they can't arrest them or take them to jail. All they can say is call the Human Rights Commission, right? Which is what they did. But what's what was really sad? It, it's leaf season. It's yeah. dough. Yeah. There's no other hotels. They were rejected, and then they left. Wow. They left the state of Vermont. Had to go all the way back. It was really sad. So again, an example of privilege. When Karen and I were walking through that, that, that process together, she, of course, experienced a privilege. Okay? She experienced a privilege because probably her race. She was given the benefit of the doubt that she must be a lawyer. right? Mm -hmm. And if she wasn't, she would have corrected them. But me, I had to correct them that I am. Right? Um, and so privilege is inherent in a lot. Privilege. There is privilege in money. Of course there is. If you have money, you are very privileged. You can buy into any town, any home that you want. You can, if you have kids, you can buy into a choice town, which, by the way, is a little bit more expensive than a town that uh, has a school that is ranked less or something like that. Okay? Uh, if, but we also know that money is deeply connected to race. Money is connected to gender as well, single moms. Money is connected to national origin and opportunities, and those things are deeply connected. When we saw the two pictures of the, the four African American and these Iowa wrestlers and so forth, there was privilege there. And the privilege was you get an identity when you're white. Okay? So if a white person does something really bad, it does not change how we view white people at all, in general. We just go, that's just one really bad a apple. But when a minority person from any group does something bad, the rest of us who are in that in-group go, oh, no, because we're going to be judged for that. All these men who are terrorists have not at all changed how white people travel. They have not changed police practices at all. Okay. They have not changed one bit about how we feel about white people and whether we feel safe around pe white people or not, even though they're all terrorists. Okay. That is one privilege of probably being the majority culture and being white in America. 
And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story about the first Asian American female judge in Minnesota. She had, um, I think one night she had one too many glasses of wine and she hit her, hit, she hit her uh, garage and then the police were called and blasted all over the news the next day was first Asian American judge, mm -hmm. right? Blah, 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 blah. But we know that other white judges have gotten into trouble too, but we never get 250th white judge slaps a kid <laughs> across the face, right? Because he is an individual. She represents an entire group of people based on her action of having one too many glasses of wine. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about implicit bias without also talking about microaggressions. And again, here, we're not going to give it the time that it deserves, but what are microaggressions? brief commonplace statements or behaviors that intentionally or unintentionally communicate a negative message about a non-dominant group. It's not always obvious. In fact, most of the times it's not obvious and it can be ambivalent. It can be well-intentioned. Given what your husband does, do you really need this job? Can you be a dear and, hey, I am pleasantly surprised by how articulate you are. I'm. <laughs> I'm pleasantly surprised by how well-traveled you are, Boar. Or, um, where are you really from? Okay. Honestly, just say, what's your national origin? I'll, I'll just answer that for you, right? But where are you really from? Sometimes it's really hard for me to answer that, by the way. I, I have a funny quick story about that. I was driving in Barrie one day looking for parking, and I didn't know like whether I could park there or not. And this woman comes up and I'm like, uh, do you know if I can park here? Cause I don't want to get a ticket. And she's like, where are you from? Uh. Okay. Now mind you in that moment, I was lost, right? So maybe it's a valid question, but I honest, I, I honestly did not know how to answer that question because I just came from Montpelier, but I also live in Pittsfield, but I just moved here from Minnesota. But I was also born in Laos. So I was like, Whoa, what's, what's, what do you really want to know? I'll just answer it for you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I never did answer that question because I, I was confused. Um, but it can also be behavior. Like turning to a male coworker for the right answer or to confirm an answer to something when your female coworker knows the answer to that. Giving eye contact in the room to only a certain person or a certain group of people to sort of check in with them. Like we don't even necessarily realize that we might be doing that. This also brings up like a way to check people when you notice implicit bias. So sometimes we're really uncomfortable as human beings to call out people's bias, right? Just like people are uncomfortable saying you're racist or that's racist and so forth. Or oh, because people get really concerned about that and then you've lost them in the conversation. Well, there's a way to check someone's implicit bias, especially, let, let's say this one example, right? Let's say that your female colleague is the one who's done all the work and is the subject matter expert on something, but your boss looks to you as the male, coll male colleague to say, hey, what do you think? Or, uh, huh, how do you feel about that? The best thing you can do in that moment, instead of saying, I think you have implicit bias, mm -hmm. is to go, actually, Sheila is the subject matter expert on this. Actually, Sheila has done all the work on this case. And it's a really nice way to go, stop asking me. And this is the person who knows. But oftentimes what we do is we just answer the question. Yeah. We answer the question. We may not even notice it. And then later we do and we go, oh, I feel really bad about that. But the reality is in that moment, you have an opportunity to draw out what is happening and to also to to be inclusive and to be respectful of your colleague who is the expert on that. Yes? What if you're the woman in that story? Yeah, well, um, I always say that if you are the victim of bias, explicit or implicit, you get to choose whether you say anything or not. You get to decide for yourself whether you want to raise an issue. And many times as people of color or as minorities, as women, we often are in this conundrum because if we say something we are perceived as problematic we might lose that reference we've made our boss really uncomfortable they're very fragile you know and like oh my gosh right Do you have a zinger? Huh? Do you have a zinger for that boss? Yeah yes no I don't but <laughs> but but I will say well because of the business that I'm in um, you know, I, I could try to just tell people, I shall, I'll think of a zinger though. But when, when discrimination happens to other people, and this is the truth, and I'm being vulnerable here, 
I feel angry and I feel protective and I feel like an advocate. When discrimination happens to me, I just feel really sad about it. And it takes me a really long time to process that. And so what I do is like a week later, I'm writing that email. Because that's when I'm done processing and I go, that was not right and that really hurt me and I, and I think that is bias and stuff. So I'm pretty open about it, but usually I take time to process that kind of stuff. And so I really respect people at, from where they're coming from and when they want to do it. And there is no magic zinger, unfortunately. If I said, if I did the zinger in the moment, I'd probably cry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then oh no, she cries. She's not, she's not professional, even though she's a victim of discrimination. Yes. I was just gonna say, and this this wasn't very long ago. This was probably about eight years ago. I was working in a department of eight people, and um, we would do brainstorming sessions all the time. Yeah. And every time, the male colleague would brainstorm something, he had our bosses, whichever male, undivided attention. Right, and when yeah. the females, and there were three of us, and we were very tight, mm -hmm. um, it, he would always say, stop getting into the weeds. You're getting oh. into the weeds on this. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so it was interesting. This I finally, interesting. and this yeah. was a year. Yeah. Finally, yeah. after a year, I was like, I am. I do not like that. Good. You know, good. And mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I said, you know, it just comes off kind of sexist that when the females say this, yeah. we're getting into the weeds. To, of course, his response was, well, I have daughters. I'm not sexist. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. And then yes. it gets even better. Mm -hmm. I then had to go meet with the general counsel of the organization mm. because I guess I raised red flags. By yeah. That. Yeah. And he's like, defending this male boss. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's like, he's, he's not sexist. He's not. Right. He says, okay, well, maybe it's a bigger issue because I don't know if you noticed, but mm -hmm. the eight of us on mm -hmm. this team are on the same org chart, are right. on the same line. So why is it all the females are in cubicles and all the men are in offices? Mm. <laughs> oh, I said, wow. it might be something you want to look at. Right. And he got yeah. flustered. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm done having this conversation. I'm not going to sue the organization. Mm -hmm. It's something you all need to really work on. Yeah. yeah. And I think that brings up a really good point about we focused in that situation on whether he's a sexist or not, as opposed to calling like his behavior out as having an impact on the women in the workplace. That that was discriminatory, even if, whether you call him a sexist or not. Like, I don't want to focus on whether you get that title. I couldn't care less, but don't say that to us. Yeah, that's what you said is not okay. Whether you call yourself a sexist or not, I couldn't care less about that. That does not matter. It's differential treatment that matters, right? And administrators yeah. very very frequently never look at themselves. Yes. I um, heard a study on um, NPR about microaggressions. Yeah. They said that um, African-American children experience microaggressions 15 times a day. Wow. On average. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that means like once every hour that yeah. they're awake. I believe that. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I believe that. But That's really sad. Yes. Yeah. She doesn't say uh, she's a African American. Yeah. She doesn't say it's a good environment for her. Yeah. That makes me really sad, but unfortunately it's not surprising. I've certainly heard a lot of those stories where people just give up on Vermont. Yeah. Are we being too sensitive? No. We've talked about Im we we talked about explicit bias and now we're talking about implicit bias. Oh boy, it's unconscious. And now we're talking about like Privilege and microaggressions, not even macroaggressions. Is micro? Are we being way too sensitive no. here? No. no, we're not. Of course, I'm HRC, so of course we're not. <laughs> yes, this is the pyramid of hate, and I know some of you are familiar with that. But most of the time, when lawyers become involved, we're already at the middle stage. We're talking about acts of actual discrimination here economic, employment, educational, political, housing, discrimination, segregation. That's when lawyers start to go, oh, right? Oh no, something bad is here. And what often is our solution 
is to settle a case, get rid of the complainer, or get rid of the bad actor. In fact, that's the best you could sometimes even hope for in an employment case is we just fire the bad actor. That'll solve things. But what put the bad actor into place in, in the first place is all of the other things that we let go of for years. Never doing training for 10 to 20 to 30 years. Allowing jokes about women or minorities in the lunchroom. Ha ha, it's off work time, so it's no just big deal. Yeah, it's just a joke. Just it's just a joke, it's not a big deal, or, you know, and then we, and then they turn into something a lot worse than that. And so, and by the time, by the time lawyers are involved, when the HRC is involved, and count, general counsels are involved, um, it is really hard to backtrack 30 years and fix a culture that is broken. It is really hard. That's why I'm so glad that Susanna is here to, <laughs> to help us with that culture, but it is, hard. It's going to be hard work. And you're going to need the commitment of everybody on board. And that's going to take a long time because we're trying to undo in a sp specific agency years. But in the culture of Vermont, in the culture of the United States, hundreds of years. Right? We're trying to undo that in our psyche. And that is going to be really difficult. I'll show you one last video. You see this and you wonder, did he lose his keys or is he blatantly stealing that bike? In broad daylight, he hammers and then saws on the chain. When that doesn't work, he pulls out an industrial-sized bolt cutter. And when he's asked, he fesses up. Have you lost the lock? Uh, no, not exactly. But he's not a real thief. Justin Kelly is an actor, and our hidden cameras are rolling. What happened? Uh, nothing. I just, I can't get through the lock. I mean, I know it's weird, but you wouldn't happen to know whose bike this is. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you. It was odd that somebody had all that, uh, that equipment. But you didn't do anything. No. That's true. That's the bottom line. Lots of people stop and stare. A few even question the actor. I guess I have to ask, is that your bike? I guess technically no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. In over an hour, about a hundred people pass by. Only George and Arlene try to stop him. Some tell us they plan to call the police later. Others say they're scared to keep moving. This woman and her friends give our thief the benefit of the doubt. When we ask why, Bisa Washington tells us first impressions matter. I remember thinking young white men don't usually carry burglar tools. So we all make assumptions, huh? Yeah. I'm thinking maybe he works for the park. We replace our white thief with this young man, Matlock. Remember, both actors dress in a similar way and are about the same age. Mm -hmm. Is that your bike? Uh, nah. Then what do you cut the chain for? Right away. Uh, right away, right away somebody right yelled. Wow. Within seconds, another person confronts our thief. Is that your bike? Technically, it's not, but it's going to be mine. More people converge. The one on the south that will you call the police? He's like stealing some of these bikes. Are you taking that bike? That's your bike? Uh, no, it's not, sir. Oh, why are you, you doing that? Do? Is this, I mean, is this any of our bikes? Is this your bike? It's not, it's, 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 no, but whoever's it is. It belongs to someone. To who? Well, but not to you. And sure enough, one man whips out a cell phone to call 911. Yeah, there's someone up to taking a bike here. Our actor triggers more reactions. Some people are even snapping pictures for evidence. I got you, bud. I got you. <laughs> you guys stealing the bike. Who's bike's over here? Once everyone moves away, we reset our cameras. And within minutes, another outraged man is yelling. Are you trying to steal that bike? Excuse me, sir, but the bike's been here for, for, for days. Like, no one's going to take it. Well, that's not your bike, then. Yeah, you okay. can't just come in and take something from somebody. Excuse me, sir. I'm not okay, I'll just take your tools away then. Please, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Don't touch my stuff, sir. Please, sir. Do not touch my well, stuff. Well, you're touching Please. somebody else's stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. All right, but this is but this has been here. Like, who's gonna take it? Well, that doesn't make it your property. Technically, it does. No, it, it, it doesn't. It, it, technically. <laughs> 
It's not yours. The tape. All right, sir. When we bring out our cameras, David here. Robb wants us to go after the thief. That kid in the red shirt. He's hacking away at a bike. He's not his. And he has the right to take it and steal it. And he's come here with... She may not look like your average bike thief, but actress Ashley Carpenter makes sure anyone who asks knows she's up to no good. Need a hand? You don't know who this is, do you? Whose bike it is? Yeah. Yeah. With a little help from Ed Fitzsimmons, the bike chain easily falls away. Oh my goodness, what a strong man you are. And he isn't the only man who stops in his tracks. What's this guy thinking? You know, you pull up, you don't know if she lost her key, if she's trying to actually take the bike, but then again, she's a girl. And would you so ever see a girl, girl doing that? Steal? You never know. Most of the times, it's a guy going to do something like that. Reginald pedals right past his appalled wife, straight to our actress, asking her if she needs a hand. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll eventually get it. I did some time in Rollway. I can, I can steal this. Oh, you can steal it? Maybe you can help me steal it. So let's talk about it. Yes. Let's talk about it. What do you see happening here? It's pretty obvious, but let's use some of the terms that we talked about already or we, some of the concepts that we've talked about during this presentation. What, what might show up? Positive bias, negative bias. Okay. Privilege, mm -hmm. right. Who's receiving the privilege here? The, 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 the whites, right? So remember that we also have some ambiguity here. Is this their bike or is it not their bike? We're not sure. But we're interpreting the ambiguity in favor of the white person. So for example, with the white actor, the ma white male actor, some of those women said, well, you don't usually see white men carrying burglary tools I didn't know if he worked for the park, right? So we're like, maybe he does work for the park. Maybe this is legitimate. Um, so we're thinking about, like, it's an ambiguous situation. Do we have a storage of information from our history to try to explain this? So when they see the African-American uh, male actor, they go, it's an ambiguous situation. Must be criminal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And notice here that with the female it has now become okay to steal, right? But mind you here, she's also a very attractive female. And I think there's been studies on attraction and the way people look. And we don't have here a African-American female to really do that comparison to, because I would guess that it's not the same thing. Yes? And if there had been a, a woman who wasn't part of the stereotype, cultural stereotype, uh, of attractive and so on. Sure. There would have been yet another bias on perhaps. the negative side. Could likely be. Sure, perhaps. Yeah. Susanna, were you going to Yeah, just to connect it back to something you showed us yeah. earlier, when they had that throng of people around the person of color, yeah. I saw some children in that group. Uh -huh. And so when we think about, yeah. well, where's Michaela getting the idea sure. that this yeah. person was stealing yeah. the money, yeah. this person was going to give the money back? Right, yeah. right. Where yeah. is she learning this from? Mm -hmm. Those are the situations sure. that are teaching children, these people steal and these people find in return. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very good. But also, they felt the... Uh, the privilege of being able to go and ask the black boy what he was doing while they didn't speak to the white boy. Yeah, or she, there was a woman with a dog, and she yeah. did, and she was like, oh, I, I just have to ask, is that your bike? And he goes, no. And she goes, okay. Right? So she's just like, well, it's wrong, but I'm also not going to call the police on you, and I'm also going to move away, whereas I am calling the police on you, and this is not okay, and this is totally wrong, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, and taking his property. Yes. Yeah, I was yeah. scared for the young black man. Yeah. yeah. They looked like they were yes. angry mob. It was a mob. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's also but before oh, it's Go also ahead. interesting that when the camera crew comes, mm -hmm. that man can't can't change his point of view. Yes. 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 Of how he originally saw the situation. Yes. He realized he's the one on camera. Not sure. Now, don't hate me. I'm going to say this. 
Those people are us. Yeah. We are those people. We, we like to judge those people as like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that, blah, blah. We don't know that we wouldn't do the same thing if we saw this experiment in real life. And that's really important. We all probably have some implicit bias. And uh, we have to be open to that. It's incompatible with our explicit attitudes. Good, well-intentioned people can have implicit bias. It does not make us bad people. We are the products of this culture, and it can influence our perceptions and our behavior. And it would be very unfair of me to tell you, hey, go find out about your implicit bias if I don't also share my own implicit bias with you. Okay. So um, I used to teach at a community college. And when you're a teacher, you have a ton of discretion, right? Do I let them make up the exam? Do I let them come late? Do I let them get out of this work and that work? And, and you have entire discretion to decide that for yourself. Do you, do you carve out an exception in your syllabus or not, so forth? And so I thought, I was reading an article one day, and I thought, you know, I should take this Harvard Implicit Bias study, because I want to be fair to my students. I want to be sure that I'm treating people fairly when they ask me for these exceptions and so forth. And I took it, and um, when I found out that I had no implicit bias in favor or against African Americans, white people, I was like, yeah. And then I took the disability one, and then I discovered that I have an implicit bias in favor of able-bodied people. Mm -hmm. Now, I have this crutch because I had polio when I was younger, and I'm very comfortable talking about that. So I have a disability. I've had a disability my whole life. And I thought, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. So of course, I'm questioning the test, and it can't be true, even though earlier I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh, how is that possible? Well. The more I sat with it and thought about it and evaluated my life, I realized, my gosh, I have spent an entire lifetime rejecting having a disability. Mm -hmm. Right? I was like, I'm going to ski, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kayak, and I'm going to travel, and I, I'm never going to be held down by this disability. And in doing that, I adopted this idea that being an able-bodied person was better than being a person with a disability. Okay. And that's really important for me to know because I am the executive director of an agency that hears a lot of complaints from people with disabilities. I cannot judge them by my own standards for myself or my implicit biases. I have to be really fair, so I try to be aware of that and I force everybody that works with me to be aware of their biases so that we can be fair to the people that come before us. So I, would, yeah. so I would encourage all of you to, to do the same thing, too. Well, if it's unconscious, can we really do anything about it? Yes, of course we can. Anyone want to take a guess? And I, I almost regret that this is at, is at the end, but nevertheless, still important. And uh, we do do a deep dive. Yes? We can think. We can challenge ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. We can look at an individual as a person, not as a member of some label. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I get passionate. No, that's great. I love passion. Passion is wonderful. Yeah. If it's unconscious, you can actually bring it to conscious awareness. Yeah. Become aware. That's the most important thing you can do is take something that's unconscious and make it conscious. Find out your implicit biases. Go take that Harvard test. Be concerned about your bias and willing to have discussions about it in the workplace, schools, and businesses. So when you're brave enough to have a discussion that says what you've been saying for this last year is just not OK, you're actually starting a conversation that is really important in the workplace about bias and the way that we talk to each other and the respect that we have for each other. Slow down. We know that implicit bias happens like when under time constraints and so forth. So you want to slow down and be mindful and be very thoughtful. When someone new shows up at the library or the front desk, take a minute to take a deep breath before you help them because your implicit bias might be showing up. Increase opportunities for contact. Educate yourself about bias, microaggressions, white fragility. Consider, and this is the most important, practical changes to policies, practices, and systems. Being aware of implicit bias is 
the first most important step, but it is not enough. Remember what I was telling you, going tying back to the very beginning. You gotta do more, and it doesn't matter if you're a sexist or a racist. We don't actually care about those titles. What we care about is what are you really doing to make change and to bring about change. Change your hiring practice says. You know, standardize questions and processes, analyze past results. Have how, how many people come here who have been treated this way or that way? And so being willing to look at your history. How have we skewed our data? What are we collecting from? And so forth. And this is all gonna differ depending on your particular agency or where you work or your neighborhood and your community and so forth, but all still very important to do. And so don't forget that number seven is an important thing to do. The Human Rights Commission does do a deep dive secondary implicit bias test where we actually go into agencies and go, what are your hiring practices? <laughs> what are your policies? And how do you mitigate implicit bias in those? And so we offer real practical things. This is the first thing, uh, um, the first part of the discussion. I want to end tonight with a very positive story. I'm sure many of you, some of you have heard this story before, but it was about the orchestra. So the, the top five orchestra in the 1970s realized that um, the makeup of their orchestra was primarily male. Mm -hmm. And they just became interested and curious about that. And so they decided that they would institute blind auditions. They'd put up a screen so that they wouldn't know who was playing the music. And just by doing that alone, they significantly changed the percentage of women that made it through all the auditions and finally made it through the final rounds onto the orchestra. Wow. Years later, they realized, you know, we can still hear high heels walking across the floor. So then they used a carpeted floor. And again, by doing that, they changed the percentage of women that made it through each round and onto the, the final orchestra. Had they not been curious, they never would have discovered that knowing who was playing the music was impacting how they heard the music. Yeah. Thank you for having me here tonight. <laughs>